students to pick up their belonging and school materials. Okay, so let's bring in here now's Meg Roberts. So Meg, this is a big move from government today that affects a lot of people all over the province. Yeah, absolutely. There is a lot of online chatter, mostly criticism from upset parents and teachers about this over the weekend, especially yesterday after the province's medical health officer said it wasn't time to shut down schools. But today that message is very different. The provincial government officially announced in school class instruction from pre-kindergarten to high school would be suspended immediately. Tomorrow will be a planning day for teachers and students will have the opportunity Wednesday and Thursday to pick up their belongings as well as schools. Regulated daycare centers in the College of the North Atlantic will be closed. The premier says they've been discussing with other officials across the country and felt it was the right time to close. What we see is a community transmission in, in uh, Alberta and some in Ontario. We know that there's a large number of people that will be returning home from, uh, from, from Florida and from you know, south of the border. And so all of this, you know, keeping in mind that we want to do what's best you know, for people in our province and for our students. So obviously there are a lot of questions about what this means for the semester. The Minister of Education says material will be sent home to students in the short term with possibly some means for online learning, but further information will be provided in the coming days. Now, there is currently no date for reopening. The English school, uh, school District says there are some challenges with this as grade 12 students prepare for post-secondary education, but the school board says it'll do whatever is necessary to not interfere with those plans. We will do uh, everything that is in our power to salvage this academic year. But our focus has been on their safety and always has been. Uh, we were anticipating we would arrive at this moment. We will execute the plans that we have in place and we will nuance them and tweak them as required going forward. Newfoundland and Labrador was the last Atlantic province to announce school suspensions. But with that change, the teachers union says it's now on board to work with government on how to manage the school year. So Carolyn, that's more than 76,000 students and children who are not going to school or daycare tomorrow morning. Wow, big number. Thanks so much, Meg. That's here and now's Meg Roberts reporting live. So schools are closing here and nationally borders are closing to most non-citizens. Announced today that Canada will close the border to all travelers who are not Canadian citizens or non-permanent residents. All airlines have been ordered to ban people with symptoms from getting on a plane. But Trudeau says help will be available to those stuck abroad. The federal government is setting up an assistance program for Canadians who are having trouble returning home. Now, only four airports in the country will handle incoming international flights. Pearson Airport in Toronto is one of them. The others are Montreal, Calgary and Vancouver. Upon arrival, passengers will face enhanced screening. All travelers, regardless of where they're coming from, will be asked if they're experiencing any symptoms. I know this news will spark concern among Canadians traveling abroad. I want to assure you that our government will not leave you unsupported. To help asymptomatic Canadians return home, our government will set up a support program for Canadians who need to get on a plane. At this time, domestic flights, as well as flights coming from the US, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Saint-Pierre-Iniquelon will not be affected. The travel restrictions announced today will not apply to commerce or trade. We will continue to ensure the supply of important goods to Canada. Across the country, there are now more than 400 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and now four deaths. All four are linked to the same senior's home in British Columbia. Well, here at home, there's one presumptive case of COVID-19, and that means the woman has initially tested positive, but that test has yet to be confirmed at the national lab. The government is taking precautions to keep the numbers low with new measures announced today. Here now is Peter Cowan joins us live from the newsroom tonight. So Peter, what are health officials saying? Carolyn, there is that good news that we are still at just one case of the virus, but nobody is sitting back. In fact, they're essentially using this as time in order uh, to prepare. So let's look at a few of the key measures that we've seen from government today. So uh, first of all, 
all non-emergency, so things like elective surgeries and non-emergency tests, they've been canceled. That was as of this morning, and that's going to continue. This is going to free up hospital beds if we start to see more cases here. So far, there are 193 people that are in self-isolation. And for anyone returning from overseas, they're going to need to stay in quarantine for 14 days. People who are coming from other parts of the country, even other areas where we have seen some COVID-19 viruses, uh, they don't need to be isolated, but they do need to keep an eye and look out for any symptoms. And if they do get sick, that's when they're going to need to go into isolation. Now, the whole idea is that they're trying to increase the capacity here because some people may not realize as we're getting ready for COVID, the system is already dealing with influenza. We have uh, more flu cases in this province this year than there are COVID-19 cases in Canada currently. We've had 461. Uh, we have 60 people in hospital at this present moment with influenza-like illnesses. You're then going to add another disease on top with the same kind of pattern. So Peter, we heard earlier from Meg that closing schools will have a big effect on parents, a lot of strain, I'm sure. What is government doing to help? There was a recognition today from the Premier that sending all these kids home, especially at a time where uh, any sort of child care centers are also closing, is going to mean that there are lots of parents who are going to have to take time off work in order to, act, to look after these kids for an indeterminate period of time. And he says he's already been talking to the federal government about a program that might be able to help them, promising there is going to be help coming, but stressed with the financial capacity the province has or how little it has, the federal government is going to have to do most of the heavy lifting here. They know that they have a role to play. There's some $11 billion that, that's already been uh, set aside, you know, for provincial and federal uh, funding. And, you know, I've made a case in our situation in Newfoundland and Labrador is a little unique to some other provinces as well, uh, that the financial capacity that we have in place, we're going to need uh, a very different response for our province than what's required in some other jurisdictions as well. Worth noting here that the Premier met with both the NDP and the PC leaders and is promising to continue to do that. And uh, both those leaders say they support the measures that the province announced today. And uh, they're really deciding to put politics aside as everyone comes together to deal with COVID-19. Carolyn. Thanks so much, Peter. That's hearing us. Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, there is concern tonight for and from frontline workers in the public service and stress for patients as many elective surgeries have been cancelled. Here now is Heather Gillis is covering that angle for us tonight. I'm more concerned about this than I have been ever before about my own health. Jack Eastwood has been waiting for an open heart bypass surgery since the end of October. I'm healthy otherwise, but this is a major blockage. The blockage is preventing the 72-year-old from being active and doing other activities he loves. Because it curtails my ability to do many things, like I don't go for a walk in the woods, I can't go cross-country skiing. Due to the COVID-19 outbreak, elective surgeries have been cancelled. That means Eastwood doesn't know when his surgery will be, and going out of the province is out of the question. Thousands of us who are concerned that if we contract this uh, because of various comorbidities, various other, you know, diseases that we have, that uh, it could be fatal. Jack Eastwood isn't the only one concerned about contracting COVID-19. So are people in a variety of frontline industries like health care and long-term care. It's not just health care. You go to renew your driver's license, that's a NAEP member. You go for a birth certificate, that's a NAEP member. NAEP President Jerry Earle says home care workers need proper protective equipment like sanitizer and gloves as they go from home to home. He's upset as he's hearing managers have ordered some long-term care workers who have been out of the country to return to work. A person returning from Australia, a person returning from the United States was into the same long-term care facility at the same time. From what I'm being told by frontline staff, one was exhibiting flu-like symptoms brought it to the attention of management, which frontline works will do, and they were told not to say nothing. Meanwhile, doctors are asking the province to allow them to see patients by phone or video. Some things that need to be decided are uh, what, uh, what methods can be used for virtual care, as well as how physicians will be paid for it. 
The medical association's president, Dr. Charlene Fitzgerald, says doctors have been advocating for virtual care since the summer. She says it's a way to care for people who have COVID-19 and those who don't. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the provincial courts are also making changes in light of the COVID-19 threat. All trials and appearances are suspended. The only exceptions is where an accused is currently in custody. In those cases, bail hearings and trials will go ahead. And tomorrow is normally a pretty big day in this province as people officially celebrate St. Patrick's Day. However, some businesses are calling off celebrations, including Bridie Malloy's Irish Pub in downtown St. John's. Aaron's Pub and O'Reilly's are also cancelling events. Business owners say it's in the best interest of staff and customers. And some stores are changing or reducing hours. From Monday to Saturday, the Avalon Mall will open at 11 a.m. and close at 7 p.m. On Sunday, it'll be open from noon until 5 p.m. Coleman's grocery stores will dedicate its first hour to, of the day to seniors, people with disabilities, and those with compromised immune systems. That's so they can shop in less crowded stores. And public libraries are closing across the province until further notice. Late fees will be waived for people who are unable to return books. Health worries are also affecting travel between the island and St. Pierre. The operators of the ferry that travels between Fortune and St. Pierre and Miquelon have announced that all trips to Fortune are cancelled effective today. And they say the trips are suspended until further notice. Now to Memorial University, where the university is suspending the semester as of Wednesday, leaving professors and students scrambling to move classes online by next Monday. As well, residents are to remain open and students are encouraged to move out as soon as possible if they can. Here now is Andrew Hawthorne headed to campus today to speak with students and teachers as they planned for a potentially lengthy shutdown. Already, students and residents are moving out if they are able to do so. Both students and professors seem to prefer the university's cautious approach to the pandemic, but that doesn't mean there isn't a lot of work to be done to make it happen. For students, there's a wide range of concerns, from how they're going to complete final exams to where they're going to live. My main concern is the lab courses, because you can't do that online. <laughs> um, but... Otherwise, mine has been great with updates and stuff, which are very regular in my emails, so I'm not that concerned about anything else. I usually don't do online courses because I don't care for them, so I'm stressed about that. I'm stressed about access to materials when I'm not going to be in the province, but uh, I'm going to try and make do, so I think that's what everyone is. There are suggestions for online tools to use from the university, but it's been largely left up to instructors on how to present their courses. Campus resources are a great equalizer, but not every student will have the same level of access without them. So it appears the rule of the day will be flexibility. Some students as well are going to be in the position of uh, having to uh, look after family members. Um, this will, could be an issue with uh, lots of students with, uh, with kids uh, when the schools close. Um, so there's issues there. Um, I do have uh, students who are worried about, uh, about, about access, internet access, being able to get online. Um, you know, really there's a kind of a gamut. And the thing is, is that new issues are coming up all the time. The university says the safety of the students and staff is taking precedent. Many of the decisions as to how exams or lab assignments will happen are going to be made in the coming days. In the meantime, all instruction will stop Wednesday to go entirely digital by this coming Monday. Andrew Hawthorne, CBC News, St. John's. A shakeup in the province's correction system. Ariana Calland explains just ahead. Seven families. Seven families used to say in the wintertime. A man many say was one of the founders of Mount Pearl has died. We told you the story of Stephen Thistle just a few weeks ago when he turned 100.
welcome back. We have exclusive details tonight on a shakeup in corrections in this province. CBC News has learned Superintendent of Prisons Don Roach has resigned. As here in now's Ariana Kelland reports, it comes amid brewing frustration over resources and funding for correctional facilities. Well, it was just two years ago last month that this man, Don Roach, took on the top job in corrections in Newfoundland and Labrador, overseeing all adult jails in the province. Roach actually came out of retirement to take on the job, but today the leadership of adult corrections is unclear. The Justice Department is not confirming his departure, instead saying there is strong leadership in adult corrections that's supported by the department. Sources say Roach has been angry over funding and budgetary issues. Her Majesty's Penitentiary is an example of that. Although no official number has been released, we do know that dozens of full-time correctional officers are off work. Some for sick leave, about a dozen for the police investigation into the death of Jonathan Henoke. His death at HMP has been ruled a homicide. So that's putting some annual leave in jeopardy at HMP. The government says it's in the process of hiring new and casual temporary workers. While Roach has only been at the helm since 2018, it has been a rough two years. Five inmates have died at three different provincial correctional facilities in that time period. A sixth man died at HMP before Roach took over. And while there has been no wrongdoing found thus far, the families of some inmates have lawsuits active in the courts. It's unclear when Roach will officially wrap up as head of adult corrections. Ariana Kellen, CBC News. St. John's. All right, time for a look at the weather. And it was a pretty chilly day in St. John's today, but it was so nice to see some sunshine. The sunshine. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, yeah, take a look at how beautiful. That's oh. a live shot of the Narrows there. Gorgeous. Beautiful night to get out for a walk. Gorgeous Down evening. Yes, yeah, very light winds. Yeah, if uh, you're housebound and you want to get out, go enjoy that beautiful evening. Sun's not going to set for another hour or so, so that's good news there. Nice. <laughs> yeah, but uh, temperatures today, uh, you know, although they were cold, uh, still felt really nice. Let's mm -hmm. take a look at where we were sitting across the province. Into those minus single digits, a little cooler for the east and the northern portion of the island, around minus 10 for St. Anthony. That was your daytime high. And then minus single digits for the rest. Uh, Burgio is hovering around the zero degree mark. Then we've got those minus single digit temperatures for Labrador as well. Currently still sitting there. We are going to see those temperatures plummet though as we head through the overnight tonight and that's because we uh, are going to see an area of high pressure dominate. Now right now we got a little bit of cloud cover happening along the south coast. That's just because we've got a little area of low pressure, very weak area of low pressure. That is uh, going to pull away as we head through the night tonight, but that cold air is going to dominate because of this ridge of high pressure, keeping that very much in place area a little bit of a disturbance happening just off the coast there doesn't look like much now it's going to head our way that's going to be our weather maker as we head into wednesday and thursday not a whole lot happening but uh, we will certainly see something from that one we'll definitely talk about that now as we head through the overnight that low will pull uh, a little bit further south but uh, overall we're looking at a beautiful evening for most of us not a whole lot happening overnight we are going to see some cloud cover move in for labrador or lab west anyway with that potential for some flurries as well but overnight temperatures uh, sitting in the minus teens for the majority of labrador uh, winds generally light 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. Uh, very light winds for the island though, and because we've got those clear skies, light winds, uh, temperatures are going to drop into the minus teens for most of us, lower lying areas uh, into the minus 20s overnight. Looks like a low near minus 12 for St. John's with those light winds, though not much of a wind chill just by a couple more degrees. Through the day tomorrow, we'll start to see that cloud cover uh, continue to spread further east uh, for the big land through the day, as well as some flurries that'll move right along with it. And then you'll see some increasing cloud as well along the west coast. Otherwise, it does look like a beautiful afternoon. Those temperatures 
uh, not too bad as well, but we are going to see the potential for some flurries, certainly along the south coast, even the west coast as we head into the evening hours. As this low continues to spread a little bit further east, you'll see it'll make its way uh, certainly by the early morning hours and those winds are really going to ramp up as well. But through the day tomorrow, here's where we're going to be sitting by 7 o'clock. You can see those winds uh, anywhere from gusting anywhere from 40 to 60 kilometers per hour, generally out of the southeast and then um, continue to strengthen as we head into the evening hours. And again, that's because that next area of low pressure is going to move in and bring in some of those heavier, uh, stronger winds rather. Here's where you'll be sitting for the first half of the day anyway. Minus one for St. John's. Those winds will shift from southwesterlies to southerlies, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Uh, areas along the south coast, again, you're going to see that potential for some flurries late day. Otherwise, plenty of sunshine with temperatures hovering near or just below zero uh, for the majority of us. Again, these winds here, this southerlies 40 to 60, that'll be in the evening hours. Uh, plenty of sunshine for most of uh, the southeastern portion of Labrador, except for uh, uh, along the street. You'll see that potential for some a few flurries. Overall, those temperatures will be sitting in the minus single digits up through Labrador, so very mild uh, with those winds picking up as well. Lab City, you're looking at a temperature near minus five. So let's look at tomorrow's forecast. We'll talk about Wednesday. It is a little messy when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. Well, family, friends and many people in Mount Pearl are mourning the loss of Stephen Thistle tonight. You might recognize his name. Back in January, I sat down with him as he celebrated his 100th birthday. Sadly, Thistle died on Friday. He was born in Carboneer, but was known as a Mount Pearl pioneer. Here's some of our conversation from back in January. So when you lived in Mount Pearl, at first, how many families were living there? Seven families. Seven families used to stay in the winter time. Only seven families. No one else lived in Mount Pearl, just seven families. I'm, I was one of, one of the seven families. What did Mount Pearl look like then? She back at me was Dirk, Dirk Road. I built a home on Park Avenue and lived in towards uh, over 75 years. We had eight children. What was it like seeing the population grow? Oh, tremendous. Tremendous. I loved it. Got a keep, kick out of it. Why did you get a kick out of it? I, I was just a part of it. Because you were part of building it. Yeah. So you helped build the first school in Mount Pearl and the first United Church in Mount Pearl. Yeah. Tell me about that. I joined the school board in Mount Pearl and we negotiated for a Tourum School here. I was a wonder, wonder the ones that were negotiated. After that school, somebody mentioned we want a church in here. So I got an in, in the church board. And why was one of the people that negotiated for a church? I love my bird. And I put a hand in everything going on there. I would like to be able to make it back to Canada. Up next, we'll hear from a St. John's couple who's stuck on a cruise ship in the South Pacific, and they are anxious to get home.
St. John's couple is anxious to get home after being stuck on a cruise ship in the South Pacific for over two weeks. Joan Walsh and her husband Pat tried to cancel their trip aboard the Norwegian Jewel cruise ship because of fears over coronavirus, but they were denied a refund, so they joined the cruise in Sydney, Australia on February 28th. Now, the ship has since been turned away from six ports and is now en route to American Samoa to refuel. Walsh says no illness has been reported aboard the ship, which is fortunate because her husband has a weakened immune system. They're hoping the ship will be allowed to dock in Hawaii, but there are no guarantees. I would like to be able to make it back to Canada. I'm, I'm, I'm watching the news reports daily in, in our room. And it's, it's very frightening. And my family and my friends and my children, they're all very worried about us, especially my husband, where he's immune compromised. Um, they're all saying, get back home quick. The, you know, the borders are going to be closed. The airlines are a mess, the, you know. So I just want to know where I'm going. Well, back here at home, a hotel owner in Gander says his business is ready to batten down the hatches. Traffic at the Comfort Inn is way down as the COVID-19 outbreak forces the cancellation of many high traffic events. Hockey games and concerts have been canceled. So was a provincial volleyball tournament last weekend. That all means less hotel traffic in the central Newfoundland town. Everything under the sun has been canceling. There's supposed to be a big uh, conference here next week with uh, delegates in the hundreds and that's about to be postponed or canceled. We're hoping that they're all going to postpone everything and not cancel it all together. So. And uh, so we're, uh, you know, making the shoe fit around here. We're reducing where we have or where we can and uh, hopefully it doesn't last too long. Well, let's take you back now to today's briefing by the province's chief medical officer of health. As we told you earlier, there is still only one likely positive case of coronavirus in the province with 193 people in self-isolation. Here's more of what Dr. Janice Fitzgerald had to say this afternoon. Our public health system continues to be working well and based on review uh, this morning of the most recent uh, Canadian epidemiological data, uh, we've updated advice and recommendations. Our public health officials are well prepared and working diligently to respond to any cases that arise. And our regional health authorities are also prepared to respond. We believe we can make good progress towards flattening the curve and reducing the impact on our province by using measures such as postponing or canceling gatherings and social distancing to alleviate spread. Social distancing is a term uh, that applies to certain actions taken by public health officials to stop or slow down the spread of highly contagious uh, disease or viruses and uh, such things as maintaining a distance of two meters between people, avoiding large crowds. Um, so, you know, people I think should rethink their St. Patrick's Day celebrations in light of this. Uh, please know that you are not alone. We realize there is probably a lot of anxiety out there. I encourage you to visit bridgethegap.ca to view any uh, the many options available to support your mental health and your well-being in general. As the Premier mentioned, an online self-assessment tool is available through 811 to determine your risk for COVID-19 and whether or not you require testing. Uh, there has been a uh, good uptake of this tool up to this point and we really want to thank people for using this service. It has helped to alleviate some of the pressures on the 811 uh, phone system. So we all have a part to play in reducing the spread of this virus. I appreciate everyone's patience and cooperation at this time. And while this may be disruptive and overwhelming, I think if we all work together, which I know we're all able to do, we will be able to help flatten the curve and improve and protect the health of our population. So anyone who is at increased risk for severe disease, we would recommend that they try to socially distance themselves as much as possible. So stay home as much as you can, try to avoid large crowds, um, try to avoid busy times of the supermarket or Costco, maybe Costco altogether. Um, so, um, you know, to, just to ensure that uh, you reduce your risk of contracting really any illness because um, it is, as Minister Haggy said, it is flu season. So 
uh, flu can be devastating as well. So uh, it is important to try to uh, keep yourself safe that way. Well, people are stocking up, but are they buying the right things? We'll continue with our COVID-19 coverage tonight. As we've been telling you, Canada is closing its border to most non-residents to slow the spread of the virus. But there's a notable exception. American citizens will be let in. The CBC's Julie Van Dusen has the latest from Ottawa. First, we will be denying entry to Canada to people who are not Canadian citizens or permanent residents. Canada's border is now tightening to foreigners. There are exceptions, the biggest carve out U.S. citizens, at least for now. The level of integration uh, of our two economies and the coordination that we ha we've had uh, over the past while uh, puts the U.S. in uh, a separate category. We have an integrated economy, integrated supply chains, and where uh, both countries rely on each other to provide essential goods. Closing the border to foreign travelers is a flip-flop for the Trudeau government. It has resisted this move so far, saying it doesn't work because a virus knows no borders. But in the past few days, Trudeau has been getting a lot of pressure from several premiers to tighten up the border. To those Canadians abroad who are scrambling to get home, there could be financial assistance if needed. However, you will be barred from getting on a plane if you show signs of illness. Anyone who has symptoms will not be able to come to Canada. Also, Canadian passengers arriving in Canada will be funneled through just four airports, Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto and Montreal, and can expect enhanced screening and be asked to self-isolate for 14 days. The Deputy Prime Minister says that will discourage American visitors. Self-isolation for 14 days in Canada, that I don't consider to be something that a tourist would like to do for a holiday. For Canadians who can't tap into employment insurance because their jobs are precarious or part-time, the government says they can expect news in the coming days about help to cover their basic expenses, including rent and groceries. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. 
Well, with more and more Canadians facing the prospect of going into isolation because of coronavirus, many will want to make sure they have enough food and other supplies to get through a 14-day quarantine. So what should be on the shopping list? The CBC's Marketplace went looking to find out. Crowds of shoppers worried about COVID-19 are heading to stores in droves, loading up on items like toilet paper, hand sanitizer, canned goods and much more, leaving many shelves empty. They're running out of things in there, it's amazing. My wife was looking for lemons, there's no such thing as a lemon in there, it's kind of extraordinary. I'm actually in a high-risk group and I'm old. Yeah, Anxiety over cancelled events and news of celebrities testing positive has been adding to the already growing fears, causing panic buying across the country. Outside a superstore in Calgary, the parking lot full, people stockpiling. It's a good idea to get what you can while you can. Kind of a madhouse right now. And at a Costco in Quebec. I saw people with like five, six packages of toilet paper. This is what we call hurting behavior. Uh, I, I don't think it's surprising people do that. Uh, it's very normal. Behavior specialist Yuma says it's natural for people to want to be prepared in times of elevated pressure, but doesn't think it's time yet for Canadians to worry. Canada is a big, man, I mean, big uh, exporter of food, so I'm less concerned about food than compared to other countries. In an effort to alleviate stress and the surge in panic buying in Quebec, the Premier reassured Quebecers. Right now, we don't expect any uh, shortage. So I think that uh, this is not necessary. Ma warns against buying too much at once. They don't have to be panicked. It's good to be prepared, but uh, just don't, you don't have to buy Brianna like for three months or four months of supply. Suggesting buying in large quantities can make it harder for grocery stores to restock shelves. He says to instead only buy a little extra every time you shop so there's enough for everyone. Nazima Walji, CBC News, Toronto. Well, it's a gorgeous evening on the Avalon Peninsula tonight. Very nice day uh, as well. It was a little bit cold. I'll let you know what's going to happen for the rest of the week when we come back.
The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, we were talking about the sunny day today, mm -hmm. but there is a bit of weather on the way. Yeah, we've later got, in the week. We do midweek, actually. Mid uh, yeah, we have got uh, some increase in cloud through the evening tomorrow night. It's going to bring some snow with it. So let's take a look at uh, what we're expecting. I left those or put those winds on there for you as well, because those winds are really going to pick up. Uh, overnight Tuesday into Wednesday morning and uh, we'll see that snow spread across as well. So that's where we'll be sitting Wednesday early Wednesday morning about 70, 70 to 80 kilometer per hour winds uh, for the southwest of the island and then as we head towards Wednesday morning you can see those winds are going to ramp up along the south coast will generally be out of the south and uh, most of eastern Newfoundland should actually see a transition through to rain uh, into the afternoon on Wednesday but note those winds again 70 to as much as uh, 90 kilometers per hour as we head into the afternoon on Wednesday for parts of eastern Newfoundland. Uh, certainly in those exposed areas, it looks like that's where we'll see the strongest winds, but uh, it moves through quite quickly. We will see that snow to start transition to rain and then by uh, the evening that should all be said and done. So here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise four or five degrees. It looks like for some areas uh, towards central have a, a transition to potentially some drizzle ending as drizzle as far as Grand Falls Windsor. Again, that we're going to have to keep an eye on that one, but uh, that's what it looks like at the moment. Along the west coast, you should stay as snow uh, hovering around the zero degree mark. Uh, cool up through Lab City as well, minus 14, and then hanging on to some of that milder air for uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay. You're looking at a high near minus four through the day on Wednesday. Now, through uh, Thursday afternoon, a ridge of high pressure will set up. We might see a few flurries along the west coast uh, through the day on Thursday, but overall uh, going to see some peaks of sun and maybe some cloud cover through the day as well. Into Friday, quiet, uh, except we will start to see some snow move in up through Labrador. This will be the next weather maker. Uh, it looks like snow again at this point transitioning to rain for the majority of the island, even parts of southeastern uh, Newfoundland again, or rather southeastern Labrador. Have to keep an eye on this one just because of that track, but uh, overall and behind that we should see some strong winds with this one and uh, that transition back to snow. Uh, here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise up uh, again above zero by Wednesday and then falling and then uh, staying above zero. It looks like at this point for Friday and Saturday well above zero on uh, on Saturday as we uh, get into that warm sector of that low pressure system and mainly rain at this point. Uh, for areas in uh, central Newfoundland, you're looking at temperatures dipping overnight Wednesday and Thursday into those minus double digits, and then we're back up above zero for daytime highs anyway. Uh, into the evening hours, we should see uh, those temperatures drop back below zero. For western Newfoundland, essentially the same thing. Uh, a little warmer for both Friday and Saturday uh, into the mid single digits on the plus side of the mercury, uh, but you will see the uh, transition from snow to rain. For eastern Labrador, we're looking at temperatures in the minus single digits right across the board, and then again that snow moving in for Saturday, Friday night into Saturday. And then for Western Labrador, uh, you're going to see these minus single digits for tomorrow and then dip back down by Friday. You'll be back into those uh, temperatures. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, in the global push to defeat the coronavirus outbreak, millions of people in Europe and around the world began a new week under wide ranging lockdowns. We're calling on every country and every individual to do everything they can to stop transmission. Several countries have banned mass gatherings and are urging people to practice social distancing. Spain, with more than 9,000 cases, remains under a 15-day state of emergency. In France, schools, restaurants and cinemas have closed, with the authorities urging people to stay home. China continues to see far fewer new cases compared to the rest of the world. It has begun easing some restrictions and is getting its factories back up and running. And in the U.S., authorities are telling people to step up their social distancing. President Donald Trump is asking Americans to avoid gathering in large groups and spend more time at home. The CBC's Katie Simpson reports. The president is urging Americans to do more to stop the spread of coronavirus, introducing measures that will dramatically change everyday life. 
We're announcing new guidelines for every American to follow over the next 15 days. As we combat the virus, each and every one of us has a critical role to play. Americans are being told not to gather in groups larger than 10, avoid eating in restaurants, food courts, and drinking in bars. And parents are being told to homeschool their kids whenever possible. These guidelines are very specific. They're very detailed. They will only work if every American takes this together to heart and responds as one nation and one people to stop the spread of this virus. It isn't an overreaction. It's a reaction that we feel is commensurate, which is actually going on in reality. Donald Trump made a direct appeal to the young and healthy after downplaying the risk factor for that group of Americans in previous public appearances. An appeal after scenes like this played out in many U.S. cities, including New Orleans, where police pleas for social distancing were ignored. If everyone makes this uh, change or these critical changes and sacrifices now, we will rally together as one nation and we will defeat the virus. While these recommendations are from the federal government, some state leaders have been taking things further, introducing new social distancing rules that are enforceable by law as a way to make sure Americans are taking this seriously. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Well, fear can spread faster than any disease, and with it, a lot of misleading or just plain bogus information. Lorenda Redekop helps debunk some of the latest claims about COVID-19 coursing through social networks. Advice about COVID-19 is popping up all over online. If you can hold your breath for 10 seconds, you're safe and don't have the virus. There's already an all-natural coronavirus vaccine, and it works. We took some claims to an expert. Colin Furness is an epidemiologist with the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information. If you drink water every 15 minutes, you're going to wash it away. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, if you thought there was COVID-19 in your throat, drinking water would push it into your body, into your intestines, where it actually might get a foothold. What about eating garlic, that that's going to help you? That makes no sense. Um, garlic has antibacterial properties. This would have no impact on a virus. What about that you really need a lot of bottled water for this? Yeah, this is not a waterborne uh, virus at all. We are seeing too that maybe this virus doesn't survive in hot countries. Viruses don't like heat and we don't know exactly what kind of threshold. If I cough on you inside, it doesn't matter what the weather is. Social media and technology companies are trying to fight this. Google searches about the virus now trigger an SOS alert and bring up information from mainstream trusted sources first. You might see this on a Facebook post. The social media platform is attempting to limit misinformation and harmful content. It's also prohibiting some ads while offering ads to the WHO for free. Furness says it's important for officials who inform the public to keep it simple. Piling on more information, even if it's great information, is actually not going to help people right now who really need it the most. People are panicking who cannot process that. For everybody else, he says pay attention to the source of the information. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Well, many service providers and retailers that operate nationwide have shut down because of the coronavirus. The latest to close their doors include Good Life Fitness Clubs and the clothing store Aritzia. Even Canada's most popular coffee chain is taking drastic measures to flatten the curve. Tim Hortons is closing seating in all of its locations effective tomorrow and until further notice. Only takeout and drive through service will be available. Starbucks implemented a similar no seating policy today and has closed some locations. How beautiful is oh, this wow. photo? Stunning. It is stunning. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back after the break.
Welcome back, everyone. And what a beautiful viewer photo you have mm -hmm. for us this evening. Yep, got that uh, one this morning, actually. It was taken, uh, this was this morning's sun, uh, sunrise. Oh, wow. It kind of looks warm. It does <laughs> You know, with it, the, the orange colors. It does. The yeah, warmth for the snow. <laughs> the warmth for the snow. <laughs> this was taken in uh, Melrose, Trinity Bay. That's a view of Trinity Bay. How beautiful Gorgeous. is that? Yeah. Richard uh, Fian sent us that. Mm -hmm. Great shot there. Thank you so much uh, for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca and uh, we'll get them on the show. All right. I guess we should enjoy the bit of sunshine we're getting while it lasts before that bit of snow moves in on uh, Wednesday. Right. Yeah. Yes. At this point, we're not looking at anything significant, uh, maybe along the south coast, but. We'll figure that out tomorrow. I would love like a few days of warm temperatures and heavy, heavy rain just to put a dent in all of the snow. It feels like it's going to be here forever. It does, but it does kind of feel like even today, I kind of felt like the weather was changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Well, thank we'll you see. so much, everyone, for joining <laughs> us uh, this evening. I hope you can uh, be back here with us again tomorrow night. Good night.